Hello, welcome. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us for this uh, Tortoise Friday lunchtime Sensemaker Live thinking. It really is very good of you to, to turn up. As they used to say in the airlines, we know you have a choice. Um, and it's great to have a good quorum here to talk about labor, which is what we're gonna to do today. I should say, as I usually do, these thinkings are done in partnership with Santander. Thank you, Santander. Um, last year, Tony Blair came to a tortoise thinking to talk about COVID. And he spent a riveting hour explaining how if he were prime minister, he would basically tear up the government and reorganize it around the challenge of responding to COVID um, with one ministry for each major task. Um, it didn't happen, it would have been good if it had, but um, this week he did it again, uh, except his subject was not how to respond to COVID, it was how the Labour Party should respond to its recent election defeats. And he basically said, um, and the exact phrase is, well, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, that it requires complete deconstruction and reconstruction in an article in, in the New Statesman. And the question is whether it should. Um, the context, as I say, is last week's local and regional elections. And we spent some time last Friday talking about the Tory wins. This is, this is about the long-term implications of Labour's defeats that day. They weren't uniform, of course. Sadiq Khan was returned uh, as London's mayor. But uh, Blair's piece, in a sense, not for the first time, did the trick of bringing a big problem and a big issue into focus. If you haven't read the piece, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna give you my uh, six point, seven point summary. Um, as I say, uh, he believes that uh, this is a moment for complete deconstruction and reconstruction of the party, points out that social democratic parties all over the world are in similar, similarly dire straits. He argues that Biden's win in the States doesn't change any of that, that a lot of that was because of the very strange uh, opponent he had. Um, he argues in the piece that the radical left basically turned voters off. Particular phrase there, very Blairite phrase, but it's worth thinking about. Uh, he, he, he said the voters found that the radical progressives aren't sensible and the sensible aren't radical. Um, a key point in his thesis is technology changes everything and poses a question, a central question, should it be used to control us or liberate us? Um, the next part of his argument is that this uh, conundrum is tailor-made for progressives if they can only seize it in the right way. Uh, and again, if you like, back to Blairite, Clintonite thinking, um, uh, the key is to craft a compelling economic message rather than uh, sort of reverting to identity politics. And he ended the piece by saying, Oh, and by the way, Labour and the Lib Dems probably need, need to talk. Uh, so that's my brief summary of a piece that was widely, uh, widely read and uh, followed up. Um, and our question is, is he right that Labour now needs to go back to the drawing board? Um, we're going to draw on lots of voices, including from in, Windside Tortoise, but also a special guest, uh, Emma Burnell, who I'll introduce in a second. But uh, the usual reminder first, um, please all pitch in. Uh, we will, uh, Luke's with me on the chat. We will try to keep an eye on who's saying what. Hi, Luke. Um, and do, do use that electronic hand. It's really good, occasionally people do. Um, be brave and don't leave it until the last minute. So, Emma, thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to come to you first. Emma is a lifelong Labour activist, a campaigns and public policy expert, I think founder or sort of CEO of Political Human um, and uh, a journalist. And as I warned I would, Emma, I'm going to quote to you something that you wrote uh, very recently since the elections, I think, in The Telegraph, just one line. Labour has not even started to come to terms with post-pandemic life and doesn't seem to have planned for it at all. 
So picking up from that, what, in your view, I mean, and, and I, I'm not asking you necessarily to sort of uh, look at it all through the Blair prism, because you've you set up a prism here. What, what, what didn't Labour do in terms of preparing for post-pandemic life that it should have done? They don't have an optimistic message. Um, we're about to go you know, Monday, we can all start hugging each other again. Uh, I don't think anyone's really thought about the actual psychological impact of that and how much it matters to people. Everyone has had just an absolutely horrific 14, 15 months. And we are desperate for good news. We're desperate for good times frankly, um, and Labour, both the activist base, but also the leadership, just seem to be stuck in a, the Tories are terrible, everything's terrible, the world is terrible, and nobody is receptive to that message right now. There will be a time, and an important time to look back at what went wrong, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, particularly with Johnson failing to lock down on several occasions soon enough, leading to unnecessary deaths. I mean, I, I'm not in any way downplaying the seriousness of, the, of, of what we've been through. What I'm saying is that at the moment, the public mood is not to look at that. They're not receptive to that message. There will be a time when they are and it will be better done then rather than done now when all we need is a break and a smile and a hug. So Emma, all we need is a break and a smile and a hug. If Labour had had uh, a more smiley, more huggy leader uh, last uh, Thursday, I mean, let, let's accept that this is not a general election. It was, it was local and regional. People weren't thinking about it quite as much as they would have been if it had been. Um, could that have made the difference if there'd been a Labour Boris? I mean, Boris, certainly the article that I wrote in The Telegraph was saying that Labour needs a little bit of what Boris has right now. Um, and now I'm not talking about the grubby um, fundraising, um, but I am talking about the fact that he does embrace and he does embody that, that optimism, that jolly spirit. Um, I hate the fact that that's true, but it is true. And, um, you know, as a political analyst, it's not my job to, to, to not see the benefits that my opponents have. Um, and I, I'm, I don't know that it's necessarily Keir Starmer's fault, particularly that he's not, I mean, he's, he's messed up a lot of things post-election. Being a bouncy tigger, it doesn't seem to be in his wheelhouse. But I don't think you can out Boris Boris, but what we could have done is had a much, much more positive message rather than, just what seemed to be the constant message of um, Tory sleaze and the NHS and Labour returned to the NHS over and over and over again. And the problem with doing that every single time is it then has diminishing returns. Mm. Um, and we kind of used those up before the NHS became the centre of the pandemic. And again, I think our message on the NHS was quite negative rather than that celebratory sense that we all have towards the NHS, the reason we all went on our doorsteps and banged pots and clapped um, for so long. So, you know, it, it was talking about the NHS, but again, in those doom and gloom terms, rather than in a sort of sunny, unlit, uh, sunny sunlit up, uplands. God, I've completely mm. lost my thread there. <laughs> No. Um, just taking a step back and, and, and a year or two back in time to when Starmer replaced Corbyn. Obviously, for Corbynites, that was a dreadful moment when thoroughgoing socialism was put aside once again in favour of what everyone assumed was going to be a new sort of centre-left uh, approach. And, and was the key distinguishing features, um, distinguishing him from his predecessor, uh, Starmer from Corbyn, were experience and competence, in a sense. Experience as um, uh, in the CPS uh, and uh, a, uh, a reputation as a, a moderate who was in politics to get things done rather than an activist who, who uh, by 
an extraordinary turn of political history, found himself leading the Labour Party. But, um, and there was a good deal of optimism on the centre left, in the centre left, on, on Starmer's behalf. Um, why do you think he fell so flat? Uh, I mean, in a sense, this is, this is still the personality question, but was there something that he and his advisors completely missed be, beyond, beyond the, the, the questions of tone that you've already addressed? Um, was it, for example, um, a failure not just to come up with a, a, a positive message of any kind, but, but any compelling economic strategy that was different from what was on offer from a, uh, a rather uh, evolving conservative position? Uh, well, first of all, I'd just like to take a, take a couple of things that you said and unpick them slightly. I don't think there's necessarily a dichotomy between moderates and activists. A lot of the people I know who are most active in the Labour Party would also describe themselves as moderates. Um, you know, there, are, there is activism across the party. It's not a question of the Corbynites are activists and the moderates are, are not. Um, also, what Keir Starmer did quite well was actually bring on board quite a few of the more, um, I guess, less completely ideological Corbynites. So he had a lot of people in his team that actually came from um, Corbyn's team. Um, and he kind of tried to bring together both halves of the party. Unfortunately, what he's done is then spend a year focused on the party. Now, sometimes that's been necessary. There's a lot of problems with the party internally that need sorting, um, not least the anti-Semitism problem, mm -hmm. which Keir Starmer has been very vocal about addressing, uh, the sexual harassment problem, which we've been considerably less vocal about addressing. Um, and, you know, there are internal issues that are quite important and need to be dealt with. But that has meant that we just haven't had an externally focused party for mm -hmm. a year. Um, and it's, you know, you hear a lot of, well, nobody's talking to us. And that's not just from voters, that's from the PLP, that's from, um, you know, senior journalists who you'd expect um, Starmer's office to be much more in contact with. Um, so they seem to have become very insular. Um, now they may be doing focus groups, but what they're not doing is coming out of those with a lot to offer. Um, I don't, I don't know, and I'm you know really deep in the weeds on Labour Party politics, what our offer is, because we just don't um, we don't talk about it enough, we don't reiterate it enough. Um, we had a Green New Deal policy, um, for example, it was announced once, we've never really spoken about it since, there's no, been no attempt to connect what that means to the everyday lives of the kind of voters that Labour needs to win back. That's really fascinating. You're deep in the weeds and you don't know what the offer is. It's interesting also to note today that uh, uh, Rachel Reeves, the new Shadow Chancellor, is taking Tortoise's advice and uh, going to try and get some big economic ideas from Team Biden. Um, look, to celebrate the fact that we've got three electronic hands up, I'm gonna to come to each of you in turn in the order in which you appear on my screen, Mehdi, Nacho and William, and then I hope we can come to Matt Dancona. Now look, whatever else you want to say, can you please also just give me your, your uh, we'll try and keep it brief so we get lots of people in, um, give me your view on whether Blair is right and Labour needs to go completely back to the drawing board, deconstruct and reconstruct. So, um, Mehdi, you're no longer there on my screen. Ah, oh, there you are, yes. Go thank, ahead. Thank you, John. I'll be very brief. I'm not a Tony Blair fan, I must confess. Uh, you know, I have not yet come to terms with the Iraq war and the role he played in it. Uh, 20 years ago, nearly 20 years ago. However, on this occasion, I think he's absolutely right. Um, Labour is, has not been and is not a natural party of government. Since, uh, since the 70s, late 70s, we've had, uh, we had the um, James Callaghan uh, government and Labour has not been in government apart from the 10 years of Blair stint. 
we keep talking about uh, red walls. And by that, we mean essentially north of England. There are two red walls. The first red wall, which started crumbling, and nobody labeled it as such, was the Scotland. And we've got the Scotland Red Wall and we've got the North of England and, and Midland uh, Red Walls. Scotland seems to have gone. And I don't think it can be retrieved. Now, without Scotland, Labour will not be able to govern, to form a government, a majority government. And uh, without a co coalition with uh, whether it's going to be the, the uh, liberals, the liberal democrats, or or uh, whatever third third party green parties it will be, it has got to go to the drawing boards. It's got to, as 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 um, uh, Blair says, it's got to deconstruct and reconstruct. And I wholeheartedly agree with him on that. Thank Great. You. Uh, thank you very much. And, and we'll probably get on to how it needs to do that. Nacho, I promised you that we'd come to you next. Thank you very much, Gilles. Um, well, the thing is that we are in the, in the age of uh, populism and basically what uh, we have witnessed is uh, notching up in the populist rhetoric uh, in, both, in both sides, I think with respect to this a red uh, blue wall. So basically, the I think across the board, the only political point that there is is basically uh, taking out even more money from London and the Southwest and giving it to to uh, to the North, just because basically uh, London is a no man's land politically. The thing is that the kind of Liber, the, the socially liberal uh, pro-business uh, standpoint that has no representation in parliament. There is not, uh, that is not a constituency that it counts. And, uh, with, but we have to think that uh, already London is giving 35 billion a year more, that, that is basically 4,000 per, per citizen a year more than it receives to the public purse. The thing is that how much else can you squeeze the the cash cow in london until you either break the engine or either you start facing a, a social problem in london the thing is that there is this leveling up rhetoric that at the end of the day it hides a strong london phobic mm -hmm. uh, rhetoric the thing is that uh, you you have seen Andy Burnham, like last few days, saying that, oh, the thing is that it was the politics were too London centric. That is like the token London phobic, xenophobic rhetoric that is used all across our political spectrum. Now, then he tried to pull back saying, oh, no, it didn't mean that you have to push London down. But the thing is that London phobia is basically has taken. The, the position of xenophobia uh, three years ago. Now the thing is that being against the metropolitan elite, aka taxpayers, um, because obviously, okay, if you want to be so independent, okay, try to be economically independent and see how the thing works. Um, so the thing is that uh, London phobia basically is the new the new pandering that that the, the politicians okay. are, are going through. It's, it's part of this cultural war that we are embedded in. Uh, thanks, Nacho. I note that Megan's saying uh, that uh, how well Labour did in, in London. And Megan, we might come to you on that in a minute. But uh, Nacho, just before I let you go, th th there is a question of priorities here, as well as a question of geography, isn't there? Um, and in fact, this um, piece, in the Guardian today about Rachel Reeves turning to Washington for inspiration made the point that there's all the difference in the world between borrowing heavily and spending heavily on business bailouts and um, concrete uh, infrastructure on the one hand, which is the present government's priorities, and borrowing heavily and spending heavily on social infrastructure like childcare and social care. So um, 
if you're saying that um, the uh, Labour and Tory policies, as far as you um, economic offers, as far as you can uh, discern them at the moment, are rather similar, I, I would contest that. No, in the in the sense of thing that we are both, they are both basically in a in a spending spree. In the sense that, okay, you can either do it through taxes, you can either through uh, uh, borrowing, that is the per taxes, or you can do it a, a combination of both. In both cases, the thing is that, especially in the case of of the tax uh, situation, the tax solutions that are uh, that that are proposed is uh, they are again London phobic. The thing is that okay. the median UK household after housing has less money than the median in the UK. And the, the thing is that more of the, some of the places that need more leveling up are in London. Okay. Um, but the thing is that if you, if you are uh, basically, okay, let's fund it uh, with uh, taxes or things that, uh, for instance, the, the government floated the idea of taking off the, the, uh, re the tax relief uh, on higher uh, higher uh, taxpayer higher rate taxpayers for the pension the thing is that 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 uh, affect disproportionate Londoners because many Londoners that have that uh, have a salary that is in the higher tax rate have less money after paying for housing transport etc than people in other parts of the country that are basic uh, taxpayers. You mentioned the thing of the of infrastructure spending uh, versus social uh, social spending. Uh, at the end of the day, I agree there are differences, but at the end of the day, it's the economic argument that that prevails, and it's pandering of okay, the okay. fake argument that so much investment is has been made in London that is a straight lie. Okay, point taken. Thank you. Um, William, I said uh, I'd come to you. Let, we'll try and keep it brief because then I want to come to Matt to uh, go back to the. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, I'll keep it brief. And some of what I say, Matt will no doubt pick up, which is essentially that I don't think it's a deconstruction or a reconstruction that's needed. It's a rediscovery of uh, the essential. Uh, small uh, big themes of what the Labour Party is about and is for and, and I think what uh, Blair was getting at is that political parties do not have a divine right to uh -huh. exist per se but they are collections of historical interests of people of uh, of uh, themes and of public policy and I think that one of the challenges is of course is that the Conservative Party appears to have stolen much of the social democratic clothing appears to have done mm -hmm. because there's much that the Conservative Party is not a, a really a social democratic party but um, Paddy Ashdown used to say that the British electorate it's pretty conservative, but it's more radical than it thinks it is. Part J, 1945, yeah. 1979, and 1997. So I think we, I think the Labour Party's got to rediscover some of these themes. It doesn't have to take itself apart again. Uh, there's a lot in the historicity of this, which Matt can take up. Uh, well, let's see. Examples. But, uh, but, and again, it's something that Harold Wilson used to say that what socialism, what social democracy was, is what Labour governments do in office. They have to capture office and, and, and enact the betterment of the people on the ground in a meaningful way. And there's tends to be and a lot of, you know, the split between the, the Beatrice Webb North London tendency a hundred year, years ago, it's about the intellectual socialism. Mm. And if you like 
the the action on the ground which the parliamentary party used to advance which was what are we going to do about the betterment of people's lives in actuality not right. um, pamphlet so that's also been a historic split not not split tension at which blair knows all about and so does mandelson i'll shut up now because I, no, but, and thank, thank you william of, thank you um uh Let's go to, to Matt if, if we can. Matt, this has not only been the week of, of Blair's piece. David Aronovich put, wrote in the Times that um, class-based party loyalties are over. What's your, what's your take on, first of all, on, on the basic Blair prescription? Well, <clears throat> I mean, to some extent, it, what's amazing is that we consider it controversial. I mean, a progressive party should constantly be deconstructing and reconstructing itself almost by definition. Um, and the Labour Party's always won when it has been less interested in being the Labour Party. No one cares about the Labour Party as the Labour Party. They're interested in their lives. And the Labour Party wins when it embraces the future in a way that is optimistic and exciting, but also reassuring. Did it in 64, did it in 97. And here we are in 2021, and it's in a pretty pitiful state, which, I mean, Blair is right. There is a fantastic sort of, opportunity now um, as we come out of the pandemic with uh, clearly the mood shifting towards higher spending and borrowing. Uh, there is the, 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 the pressure of climate change. There is the, the, the opportunity and, and, and uh, challenges of technological revolution. There is the question of how you make globalization and capitalism work fairly. Um, and I think there's a, a general issue around fairness and the sense people have that, that, that things are not rigged in interests, they're in rigged in interests of a, of a minority, and that shows itself in all sorts of things, you know, aspects. So there's a kind of suite of issues where a, um, a progressive party should be prospering. Um, and I agree with Blair that, that it should be being ruthless and uh, you know, endlessly imaginative and unencumbered by what's gone before um, in doing so. Where I don't agree with him is that I think he betrays his generation in his, the way he dismisses identity politics. Blair was 43 when he became prime minister. And like Clinton in America, he kind of put into administrative practice the values of the 60s and 70s revolution with which he'd grown up. Um, I think he's far too dismissive of what's going on at the moment. Um, I think that the, the, the kind of, the, the range of social justice movements we're seeing, BLM, Me Too, Extinction Rebellion, um, and other movements like that are the beginnings of something which at the moment doesn't command a majority, far from it, but is, it reflects an energy and a generational shift that isn't going to go away. And this is where you realise at that point in the essay, you remember that Blair is nearly 70 and he is not uh, actually, his antennae are not as acute as they used to be about the, the, the political uh, music out there. And I think the next Labour Prime Minister, whoever she or he is, will be someone that is able not only to uh, address the, 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 the range of sort of challenges I've listed there, but also to navigate, a, just as Blair navigated a, um, a path between social justice and capitalism, will be able to uh, navigate a path between um, the, the, uh, the ideas that are presented in identity politics and the kind of cartoon right-wing populism that, that the Tories are presenting now. Now, this is a very, very difficult task, but getting into power is very difficult. And I, I mean, I think there are a series of things he, that can be done, but they, they, they require much less caution and a much greater um, sense of confidence than Starmer has so far evinced. Matt, thank you. It, I, I want to ask you something else in just a second. Uh, after that, I'd like, if possible, to come uh, back uh, back to Emma and also to Jennifer Allison, if possible, to see what they made of, of Matt's point about Blair dismissing identity politics at its peril. But uh, before that, just Matt, while we've got you, are, are there not some lessons for social Democrats in this country to draw from 
the Biden result. Blair says there aren't. Blair says it's an anomalous. But I put it to you for the sake of argument that he created a big tent of all the of all the uh, Democratic uh, uh, candidates. Um, he <clears throat> was the least uh, radical, even if he's turned out to be a radical spender now, uh, the least identitarian, if you like, and the most successful. Um, and you could also argue of Hillary Clinton before him that she failed because she tried to assemble uh, a coalition summoned by many dog whistles instead of uh, making one cohesive economics-based offer. So that's a long way of asking you, um, isn't the message of the Biden result that actually uh, Blair's right that nothing works if you don't have the economic offer in place. Yeah, of course you have to have the economic offer in, <coughs> excuse me in place. Um, but I think the one of the lessons of the last uh, six, seven years has been that politics is no longer a branch of economics and just coming up with the right economic solution is not enough because people define themselves politically more and more by values, identity, affinity. And uh, is, is there a prospect of that changing? Not conspicuously so, no. So I, I, my feeling is that the, I, I, I agree with you, Charles, that, that it's, I, there, of course there are lessons to be drawn from the Biden um, experience. More, I think, in the way he's governing, which is more radical than one would have anticipated and more purposive um, than most of us thought. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, 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 we, we did a take uh, last week, a really good take on, on how, Biden, you know, Biden's uh, economic plan should be borrowed or what spirit should, content should be borrowed by Rishi Sunak. And I think that's absolutely right. But um, I think where, where Blair, Blair has a point is, um, you know, Trump it was, a, to put it mildly, a singular president and a singular kind of politician. He, what he was signaling to his party and the wider world is you can't rely on the Tory party behaving like Trump. They're much more sinuous, much more uh, nimble. Uh, and, it, and power won't drop into the, the lap of the Labour Party, which is always the mistake that uh, some Labour uh, supporters make. Um, so yes to um, an economic package, but no to the idea that if you come up with the right figures on tax and spend, suddenly all of those Red War voters come back into your arms and say, sorry, you know, are bad, we'll vote for you. That's not how politics works now. All right, thanks. Um, I did uh, threaten Jennifer to come to you. I, I don't know if we can, because you've, I'm struck by what you're saying in, in the chat about working in a solutions focused way. Uh, well, you can't, yeah. Tell us what you're saying here and particularly about um, why you think uh, so many young people are completely disengaged. Um, that wasn't I'm sure I have the answer to. That was what I was saying. I mean, I don't know wh whether I'm representative of young people or not, because there often seems to be a binary, because a lot of the um, activist movements that Matt was mentioning, their core is young people. Yeah. But they, as... Uh, like whether their number isn't necessarily massive, you know, whether young people as a whole are more completely disengaged or very engaged in those sort of activist movements. Um, I, I don't really know. Um, yeah, I wasn't, wasn't sure what the question was you were gonna come to me with. I mean- I Well, I'm, I'm actually gonna come back, come to you now with the question that we've been asking everyone do you agree with Blair that Labour needs to start again? Um, yeah uh, I, I don't know about start again but um, I mean one of the things I was having a conversation with Luke in the chat about how uh, we'd I've been watching the news the other day with my dad and we were both completely baffled by someone who was they're saying 
they've been a Labour voter for most of their life and had switched to Conservative because they no longer felt that Labour represented the working class. And I thought, you know, whether or not you think that's true of Labour, they may have moved away from their, you know, their traditional roots of um, unions and working class or not. But I didn't really understand how Conservatives were seen as more of a working class choice. And I did wonder if that was more to do with working class being a kind of coded way of saying the white working class mm -hmm. male, um, because the right wing have been putting these messages that if you are of that group, the left no longer care about you. Um, and they've picked up on that. And it's, but it's really hard to understand why people are moving away from Labour and towards Conservative because they feel that I think they they feel they feel like their values are more appealed to by conservatives, but it, whether or not you know conservatives actually do anything to help the issues that affect them, I don't know. It's a really interesting point about whether working class has become code for something more specific. Let me come back to Emma and then Chris Cregan. I, I see your hand up, and we'll come to you, um, Emma. Um, if you'd like to pick up on, on that point, w whether there, there's a nuance that um, we may be missing about what working class means now, please do. But I wanted to ask a slightly broader question. Do you think that um, organised labour is still a valid organising principle for politics? Uh, or do you think that's had its sort of 150 years and that's over now? Um, gosh, there are so many um, avenues that I want to go down. I'd love you to have me back on to talk about... Um, the floor uh, is yours, Emma. About ...London, um, because, but I, I would get far too um, diverted from the actual point of what we're supposed to be discussing today. Um, the thing is, Class has changed massively from the kind of um, industrial setup that Marx was writing about in the late 1800s, um, from the way that the Labour Party was set up around um, that conjunction between middle class Fabians and working class union members. Um, and the unions have not really kept up with the modern workforce and modern economy. Um, so a number of different things happened. The unions, um, when they were under threat in the late 80s, early 90s, what they did was amalgamate a lot of smaller unions where people had come up from the shop floor to running the union. So they had real experience of what it was they were talking about. Unions now have a lot of professional people running them from head office who haven't come up from the kind of work that they're representing. They're also these much, much broader um, unions that, that they represent so many different types of workplace now that they don't have those specialisms. Um, now they'll have someone in, you know, so the oil and gas uh, running that section and they'll have people working that section, but they don't have that real kind of granular understanding that they used to have when there were much smaller unions representing different types of workplace. The other thing is that we don't have nearly as many big, big workplaces uh, as we used to. We're not a manufacturing country in the way that we used to be. Um, they haven't had um, density in places like Amazon warehouses and the gig economy. Um, and they aren't in small workplaces. And I had a real struggle with that myself. I used to be a member of Unite. I was working in a small workplace and I was made redundant. And as I was going through the redundancy process, I contacted my union to whom I paid quite a lot of money every month and said, will you come and support me um, through my redundancy process? And they said, no, we don't do that. And I was like, well, if that's not the point of a union, what the hell is? Um, so I feel like the unions have not caught up with the modern workplace, the modern workforce and the modern economy. Um, so they too need to be completely deconstructed, but that doesn't mean that we don't need that kind of workplace representation. And the reason I know we need it is because um, those who don't want it are so desperate to make sure that we don't have it. I and mean, if you look at a simple thing like the effect that tribunal fees have had 
um, on people being able to uh, assert their workplace rights. It's absolutely essential. And of course, that this is a huge barrier for people. So I 100% believe that we need unions. I just 100% believe that we don't currently have the unions we need. That's really fascinating. You, um, you started with reminding us, certainly reminding me, that Labour thrived, at least at times in its life, with this coalition of middle class Fabians and working class unions. Um, presumably, if Labour ever comes back to power, it has to uh, reconstruct some kind of coalition like that, or an, a, a 21st century equivalent. Um, Based on what you've just said about how the unions have evolved, I mean, can you peer into the future and, and tell us what you think that coalition looks like? Because the narrative that's emerged from last week's, is it last, yeah, last week's elections, is um, Labour has a new base, which is uh, young, young metropolitan graduates, totally disconnected from the old base, and ne'er the twain shall meet again. But how do you see... Uh, a, a new Labour coalition forming? What, what, would, what, what are the groups called in it? Well, that, that is the really, really um, complex question because where Labour needs to create a coalition is between what is currently um, known as the precariat, i.e. the kind of young voters um, or even older voters these days, um, people my age who are still renting, um, who don't have the kinds of rights that were traditionally associated with, with being in a workplace, who don't have the kind of security uh, of home um, and of, of work that, you know, were part of the bargain that we all mm -hmm. made um, with society. And um, they need to then bring those people together with those people who are not university educated, but do own their own home. Because actually there is a whole generation that exists like that, who are, they are the working class in traditional um, value, in the traditional model, but actually they are not living precarious lives in the way that, that we have always traditionally seen the working class as doing. So there's a real um, value shift between the traditional working class, the older working class, the outside of London working class who are able to own homes, want to drive their cars, need to drive their cars because there are no public transport outside of London. Um, and the metropolitan dwelling young people who are very insecure about their future, their lives, their prospects and their ability to actually plan. And that, I mean, I, I'm very lucky. I do own, well, leasehold and let's, not get into that bloody can of worms um my my place uh but i'm not currently uh I, you know i'm a company director who's been smacked around by the pandemic wasn't entitled to any help um it's oh yeah i live that precarious life and mm -hmm. i know that i've got more in common with a probably a 20 year old graduate than someone my age who is living outside of london in a comfortable and secure job how do I reach them? How right. do I make sure that we're all living in the same country? Because sometimes it really feels like we're not. And that is that kind of division, um, taking apart uh, away all the identity divisions that we insist on putting on ourselves. Um, actually, that just that simple geographical and comfort division is I think one of the biggest things that we don't talk about. That's really fascinating. And I, I hope we can come back to it and maybe find some answers in the next 10 minutes to that question. How do I reach them? Chris, I promised we'd come to you. What's on your mind? Hi, thanks. Um, it's a fascinating discussion. Um, I, I was reminded um, with the intro music um, of work. I worked for the Labour Party in 1997 um, during that election. And um, I was reminded of how, how positive we were, um, how confident we were, um, how we believed we had the right message, even if we personally didn't necessarily believe in it. Um, you know, I went, and, I went and did 13, 14 hour days at, at Woolworth Road for six weeks, even though I had lots of doubts 
uh, about some of what was in the manifesto because we had something that was clear, it was positive, it was relevant. Um, the condition, the Slees thing, by the way, back then were the conditions. They were, the, the Slees thing wasn't the agenda. They were the conditions in which we had an agenda and we were advancing an agenda. And, you know, I was never particularly inspired by, I'm actually more inspired by him now, by Tony Blair now than I was back then. Um, but even back then it didn't matter to me because I could see that others were, and that gave me, that gave me confidence. And I think the other thing is that we were really clear about what we were responding to. And I think the important thing about 1997, looking back to remember is that we, um, although we were responding to major and to sleaze, um, for people of my generation, and I was 18 in 1979, that was the first general election in which I voted, um, we were actually responding to Thatcher and Thatcherism. It, that's, that's what 1997 was about for very many of us. And we were really, really hungry for power, um, really hungry for power. We wanted to win in order to do stuff um, about the agenda. So, you know, um, and by the way, on, on, on the article, you know, I, I, I agree with Matt really, um, you know, on, on, on both counts. And I think the identity politics thing is the thing I definitely don't agree with Blair about. Um, and I think there's a, there's a kind of a deceit um, that class politics, as we knew it, wasn't a form of identity politics, which really, really irritates me um, in the debate that's happened here and in the debate that's happened um, in the US. And just very, very briefly on Scotland, um, from where I sit and where I'm no longer a default Labour voter, which I never thought I would say, I, you know, I voted Labour for 35 years um, and now I'm a kind of a swing voter who you know could be won back and occasionally votes Labour but sometimes votes SNP. Uh, I'd never have believed a decade ago um, that that would be the case. Part of the problem and maybe Anna Saar was just about to overcome this is that Labour has this and I think somebody harked back to this point earlier, Labour has this terrible sense of entitlement here it just drives me absolutely nuts, you know, and they need to get over it. And I say they, and I once would have said we. Uh, thanks, Chris. I want to stay with you for a second. Robert, we will come to you. I, I see your hand up. Chris, you agree with Matt that Blair has it wrong on identity politics. In a really kind of practical uh, campaigning sense, how should Labour mine identity for votes next time round, I think it because I think I think it isn't just about identity. I think it's also about issue-based politics, and I think it's about creating a, a coalition around identity and around issues. Right. And I think it isn't just about identity and issues. It's about a way of doing politics as well. And much though I, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm no fan of, of Jeremy Corbyn's, you know, I was around London Labour politics for long enough and in Hackney North, where uh, Emma's dad once sent me out canvassing again because my poll, uh, uh, my poll card wasn't good enough in the dark days of the 1983 election. Um, but I, I, you know, I think much so much though I, uh, you know, I, I, I loathed all of that. The momentum thing was interesting because it wasn't just about identity and issues, it was about a way of doing politics. Um, so it's about making a connection between the issues and identity and a, and a way of doing politics differently. Um, fascinating. Uh, Robert, we're going to come to you, but just first, I want to come back to Matt, if I may, on the issue that Chris just raised of, of issues. Question. Um, have Europe and climate sort of superseded traditional uh, Labour rallying cries as issues that, that are more prominently in the forefront of voters, especially young voters' minds? And if so, um, how would a new, a new Blair, like a, a charismatic Labour leader, harness them? Uh, well, any party that organizes its electoral offer around Europe uh, is committing suicide. It's crazy. I mean, uh, at the moment, you can be, uh, you can understand that uh, you, you can believe in rejoining as I do, although I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. 
Um, but the idea that the party, the, the Labour Party should become the party of rejoining um, is, I mean, they should just get it out of the way now and give Boris Johnson another 15 years in power because th we've had that debate. I'm very sorry the way it went, but it's done now. And there are lots and lots of process issues and very important administrative and trade and commercial and diplomatic issues that will arise out of Brexit. But organising yourself around Europe is, is crazy. Climate's different. Climate is an organising principle, but it's boring uh, to a lot of people. And what is badly needed is a way of making it explicable and a form of expression of broader social solidarity in the way that healthcare was during the, the 40s and the beverage report was during the 40s and which Attlee brilliantly uh, mobilised in the 1945 election to Winston Churchill's great success, a uh, great surprise rather. Uh, so I think, I, think, I think climate change is, uh, it can be mined as long as it's seen as part of a broader argument about the future so that it's not just seen as, as forcing everyone to weave their own yoghurt and lead a traditionalist lifestyle, um, uh, but seen as part of a technologically exciting um, uh, growth producing different way of living that's healthy and 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 uniting and outward looking and I, I mean I think one one area where Blair is 100% right is the open versus closed argument that's a very good way of dividing things um, Labor, the Labour Party must be the open party because the Tory party is becoming the closed party it's becoming the little England you know it's becoming the sort of we're nowhere in Scotland we don't really care about Northern Ireland um, we want to mobilize the Royal Navy against uh, refugees in the channel. Um, and that's a, that's a, you know, that has appeal to some people, but it's a very, very dangerous game to play because if you don't turn out to be good at delivering stuff, like in the public services, in the economy, all that just starts to look like so much sloganeering. Thank you, Matt. Andrew says in the chat, climate change is not boring when people understand what it means. They imagine water levels 10 meters higher and mass migration caused by it. And by the way, uh, I, I've noticed Michael Kowalski uh, um, uh, on the subject of uh, London independence and its um, comparability with Denmark and Switzerland. Uh, Michael, I think you should get together with Nacho and form that London independence party. Um, Robert, uh, I see your hand, but not your face. But uh, let's come to you. What did you want to say? So uh, I think the um, listening to Emma, she was actually saying lots of things that I would want to uh, contribute to, but she said most of them. But the key message I think taking out of that is that there's nothing to coalesce that distributed nature of people that were traditionally, um, that are now Labour's uh, new core. Um, there are a couple of things that could bring that together if we focus on a couple of things. One is the liberal values of a, tr of a traditional Labour voter, whether that's uh, fighting injustice or fighting inequality. Those are now rooted across the piece, not just in the older generation like myself. I actually retire next week. I'm not. I'm starting new work and new jobs. Um, but the young people and to focus around the issues that exemplify the inequalities and the right-wing um, effect destroying our liberal values. And whether that's climate or Europe or internationalization, um, Black Lives Matter or the NHS, I think there's a lot of people who would coalesce around somebody who could produce a vision to stitch that together and say, we're the new liberal organization, we are, um, for removing inequality, for truly levelling up opportunity and lifespan, lifetimes. Um, but we need that vision to coalesce around, and it needs to be new and forward-looking. And I says, you know, as a traditional Labour voter, it's always looking in the past. What went wrong in 1977? What went wrong um, all those years ago? Why have we lost this older generation who, um, where I started in manufacturing years and years ago, um, the world has changed. And I don't think um, the unions have changed, as Emma said, and I, don't, I certainly don't think Labour has changed with that new thinking, that new economy, which is hugely diverse. Robert, uh, would you agree, um, talking about the challenge that you 
just described to find new ways to make liberal values Labour's own, as it were, that there, there is a there is a choice of words challenge that and, and Blair suggests that that um, Labour flunked it uh, or at least well he, he says in his piece defund the police I'm not saying that that Starmer adopted that as a slogan but he, he says defund the police may be the left's most damaging political slogan since the dictatorship of the proletariat um, what, whatever issues Labour alights upon to reassemble support if it does go back to the drawing board it's got to be careful how it describes them doesn't it it certainly does and i think um, if you talk to the younger um, educated generation those people who've been to university and paid their um, their fees about defund the police they'd know exactly what you were talking about but if you talk to the guy down the road who's um either close to retirement or has been in manufacturing he would see that as being hugely negative no, there's not one size fits all, and I think that's part of the problem, that the diverse nature of the people um, who would ascribe to liberal values and wanting to uh, make the world a better place in that kind of way um, are diverse. They're going to need diverse messages, but the, the messaging has to be um, really clear, and at the moment it's not. It has to be catchy, and that, I think you can see where the Tories on the right wing have uh, managed to capture it, get Brexit done or whatever else. Mm. Really simple messages um, with simple sounding solutions, which we all know are complete bollocks. But uh, mm. messaging is really important. Um, I don't think Blair's got it right in, in some ways because he's still, he's still an oldie and thinks a bit oldie. But his internationalisation, I think, is something I, I would subscribe to. Um, I don't think... I don't understand why Burnham said the other day um, freedom of movement has destroyed um, jobs and um, wages in the UK, which is complete nonsense. It's been proven many times that freedom of movement actually improves waging, wages or has little or no effect on wages in, internally. But the young people are doing things that the traditional... Um, working class never did, which or never did to the same extent, which is go and work abroad for months and months on end, and that's been taken away from them. So they can't now be um, working in, in in the ski season, for example. You just can't do that yeah. as easily as before. And there's a huge amount of people who've done that and been abroad to a huge degree compared with what the traditional um What's, what Labour sees the traditional voters, they're going to have a much more international viewpoint. And that's not reflected. And it's certainly... Andy Burnham, who I thought was a, a possible saviour in this place, turned around the other day and said, freedom of movement has depressed wages... Effectively said, depressed wages in the UK. It's complete and utter nonsense. Robert, thank you. Because we're a little one minute over, I want to come back to Emma to give you uh, the last word. Can I invite you to answer your own question? How do you reach, how did you actually put it? Uh, um, my notes are so, um, how do I reach them, you put it? You described your own sort of demographic and those outside London, the non-metropolitan old working class. Um, how, uh, answer that question. Uh, and also, uh, just as a kicker, can you, if it's not gonna be Andy Burnham, can you tell us who it is gonna be? No. <laughs> I mean, um, we haven't got enough time for me to rant on about the, the appalling way that Labour um, has failed to bring talent through the party, um, that factionalism and loyalty to faction and your willingness to just be lobby fodder um, has massively trumped any intellectual or campaigning um, prowess um, uh, Labour's selection processes are just a joke. Um, on the other question, I've been thinking about this a lot. I don't have a good answer yet, um, but I think it's about our current approach to what is termed identity politics is ironically a very closed approach. 
So we think we're the open party, but actually what we do is reject everyone who doesn't 100% agree with us on 100% of everything. Actually, we, and we all have identity politics, whether that's a working class white guy from Wokingham or a um, young black man from uh, Wigan. I mean, mm -hmm. God knows why I ended up in those two towns, but there I did. Um, but what we need, far, you know, we need to build coalitions. We need to build spaces where people don't just shout past each other, but talk to each other. And tortoise is obviously that that's absolutely what you're trying to do here. And I think that's um, really commendable. Um, if we can have an open approach to identity politics that understands that there are clashes, there are um, spaces where we're never going to agree, and there are important debates that need to be had, rather than simply saying there is no debate, we are closed, um, that's the end, you are wrong, we are right, shut up now and go away, you out of touch, out of fashion, out of uh, liberalism people. Um, then that I think is, it's not a policy answer, it's not a political answer necessarily, but it is, I suppose, a tonal and content answer about how we approach each other better. Um, and I think that that's um, a far more liberal, open place to start. And it certainly would be a place that was more comfortable for a lot of people. Um, and I, I, yeah, I I know some people will find that approach abhorrent because they just think that you just have to say X is wrong and is always wrong and can never be right. Um, but I don't know how you persuade people who think X to give you a hearing if you simply shut them down. Thank you very much, Emma. Thanks everyone who's joined us. Um, there's a lot of agreement, I think, that Blair was right in his central point that Labour does need to go back to the drawing board. Um, agreement too, that in some respects, his thinking perhaps is that of someone approaching 70. Um, I was very struck very briefly by Mehdi's analysis, not one red wall, but two, uh, by Chris's recollections of 97, when Labour was both confident and hungry for power. They don't seem to have been either of those two things last week. and. Emma, your uh, brave uh, attempt just now to answer your own very difficult question, how do you uh, bridge the gap between the evolving constituencies that could be Labour, answer openness, and as Robert was suggesting, uh, another way of looking at that might be internationalism. Um, those are my half-formed thoughts. I'm sure you will all have much more fully formed ones. Bring them. Uh, to our future thinkings on this and related subjects. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a great weekend. Um, and we will see you next week, not least, for the launch of our Accelerating Net Zero Coalition on Tuesday night. Thanks very much. Bye. <laughs>